On May 7th of 2011, a South African carpenter by the name of Richard Van Aas lost the four fingers of his right hand in a table saw accident. He soon learned that replacement prosthetic fingers can cost from thousands to tens of thousands of dollars, even though they're very limited in their, in their functionality. So he chose to make his own fingers. As he began to research ideas, he stumbled upon a YouTube video of an American man who had made giant uh, mechanical prop hands. Meet Ivan Owen and his wife, Jen Owen. Ivan Owen is an inventor and uh, a maker of incredible, amazing, wonderful things. He looks scary, but he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet. <laughs> his wife, Jen, is a photographer, and she's also a blogger, uh, a writer, and a webmaster. And she manages and writes for the, uh, the Enable uh, community website, enablingthefuture.org. So Richard asked Ivan for help to make a, to make a, pair of fing uh, a set of fingers that he could use. And uh, Ivan, uh, of course, said yes. And uh, after uh, corresponding for a year uh, via email and via Skype, Ivan actually went to South Africa to uh, help Richard in the construction process. As they worked, word got out about their project, and they were approached by a woman named Yolandi, who asked the two men if they'd be willing to make uh, a hand for her son, Liam who was born without fingers on his right hand. Well, the two men agreed to help, and they began prototyping designs for Liam. Now, the traditional means of prototyping, if you're prototyping using traditional tools, it can take a lot of time and a lot of human energy. The men cut sections of aluminum and drilled them and riveted them to make joints. After Ivan returned to the United States, the two men continued, their, continued their, product, their project and their collaboration. And a co-worker of Ivan's uh, suggested that they might use a rapid prototyping machine, otherwise known as a 3D printer. So MakerBot found out about their project too, and that they, uh, and that they were seeking 3D printers, and actually donated two printers, and sent one to Ivan and the other one to Richard. And uh, Ivan learned uh, to uh, 3D model. He learned to model 3D objects using OpenSCAD, which is a free and open source design tool. And he used uh, his, uh, his models to construct uh, a hand for Liam. Uh, what the two men discovered was that the uh, iteration process was much, much quicker than using traditional tools. They could print a component in one or two hours. They could print an entire hand in less than a day. So the process as they went from design to design ended in something that they called RoboHand. And for Liam, it worked very well. They could have patented the design and tried to make a lot of money. But instead, they chose to share the design with the world. They uploaded to Thingiverse under an open source license. And now what this means is that anyone can download these files, and they can print these files, and they can make for themselves a hand. Well, MakerBot got very excited about this project, and of course they had had a hand in it. So they made this uh, wonderful video. You can find it on YouTube. It's MakerBot and, and RoboHand. And uh, it, it tells the story and, uh, and shows uh, Liam with his 3D printed hand uh, picking up objects and using it to do different things. Um, it's a great video, and you really should see it. In fact, a lot of people did see it. It's quite inspiring. But what's even more inspiring is if you scroll down to the comments, uh, what you'll see is that a number of people uh, are uh, saying things like, uh, hey, I have access to a 3D printer. If there's someone in my community who could use a hand, I would be happy to print one for them. And in fact, I'll do it for free. Enter John Schull, research scientist at Rochester Institute of Technology's Magic Center. That's media, arts, gaming, interaction, creativity. He saw the comments and the video, and he saw an opportunity. So he left his own comment on the, on the video, and he also started a Google map. And he said, OK, MakerBotters, if you are willing to make a device, if you're willing to print a hand for someone, put yourself on the map and the map began to fill. And this is the map as it is today, uh, yesterday, actually.
And as the mount filled, these people started asking John, okay, well, what do we do now? We know where we are. And so John created a Google Plus community so that people could connect and, and help each other. That community has grown steadily since its inception two and a half years ago, so that today it boasts uh, almost 7,000 members. Peregrine and I, uh, we made our first hand uh, two years ago, uh, in the summer of uh, 2013. Uh, he had sent me a link to the MakerBot RoboHand video in April. And we didn't know anything about the Enable community at that point, didn't know that such a, a community existed. Uh, but uh, when I saw it, I, I almost couldn't believe it. I mean, here was uh, a little boy with a hand uh, almost exactly like Peregrine's on the other side of the planet. And here he was in this video picking up objects off of a table and catching a ball. So I didn't know very much about uh, 3D printing and I, or about uh, 3D design, uh, but I, I was interested. Uh, I just really didn't know about it. So that summer, uh, Peregrine came to visit me and we bought a 3D printer for $800. And we went to Thingiverse and we downloaded the files for something called the Snap Together RoboHand. Now, we didn't uh, really know how to construct a hand after we'd printed it. We had all the components. Uh, it took a little while to get the printer working right, but uh, that's normal when you get a new printer, a little trial and error. Uh, so we looked around the house, we looked around uh, community uh, grocery stores and hardware stores to try to find uh, hardware to put it together. So this is our first device, and uh, it worked. It worked pretty well. Uh, when we completed it, I shot a little 30-second video and put it up on YouTube. And then I went back to the Thingiverse page, and I left a comment to thank the designers for, uh, for the design, uh, saying that we had had uh, a great experience and that uh, Paragon was able to pick things up with his left hand now. Uh, so Ivan actually contacted me about two days later. I got a, I got a message from him. Uh, which is amazing because he's like my hero, right? Uh, so, uh, and he asked if we had any images of the device that we had, uh, that we had created, and uh, I linked him to the YouTube video. He got excited about it and asked us to join Enable, which is a community of volunteers who make free 3D printed prosthetics for anyone who can use them. And here, uh, Ivan was actually able to, uh, Ivan and Paragon were able to meet up in Seattle uh, right before Ivan gave a TED talk and uh, his wife took this lovely photograph. Uh, you should know but that at this point uh, Jen Owen had started the enabling, enabling the future.org website which is uh, the Enable community website. Immediately Paragon saw problems or felt problems with, with the device. It didn't have very good grip strength and uh, when he did try to lift something heavy uh, fingers would break so uh, which is okay if they're plastic fingers. Uh, <laughs> so I printed him a whole box of fingers and sent them out to, to, to Washington State. And then, uh, and then I started to learn Blender, uh, started to learn how to, how to model uh, 3D objects in Blender uh, so that I could uh, improve, improve the design. And after many iterations, we had something that we could call a, a unique design, which we called the Talon Hand. Uh, and we actually sent the, the design files. The design files, 3D design files, are actually quite small. So we were able to send those by email to Ivan Owen, who, uh, who then uh, printed and manufactured a hand for, guess who? <laughs> for Liam. So in the open source spirit, we uploaded the files to Thingiverse. And since then, uh, people from different locations around the world have printed and manufactured Talon hands. So Peregrine was our first client, although he was as much a designer and a maker as a client in that, in that situation. This handsome young gentleman is our second client. Uh, his name is Odysseus, or Odi for short. <clears throat> uh, now he lives in Greece, which is pretty far from where I live. Uh, but I volunteered to make him a device. And um, of course, there's, there's a problem. How do you make something that's going to fit properly for someone who lives very, very far away? So I gave his parents instructions for taking photographs. I told them I needed a photograph of, from above, of both hands out on the table, with a ruler in the field, and a photograph from the side, with his arm against the wall, and a ruler in the field, so that I could, uh, so that I could ju um, uh, judge scale. And then from those photos, I was able actually to bring the photos into Blender, into the 3D modeling program, 
and then design a device right around his anatomy. So you can see this, uh, this device has three fingers. Uh, Odie doesn't have a lot of movement, so uh, I thought that um, the resistance of three fingers would be considerably less, 40% less, than the resistance from five fingers. So I printed the parts and added leather and screws and cabling and straps and assembled his device. And I uploaded the design to Thingiverse, and I named it the Odie Hand after its first user. And then I put it in the mail and sent it to Greece. And I was actually too, uh, able to, to make a, a similar device for another young client. This is a little girl. And uh, you can see her image is right next to his image in, uh, in Blender. So the implications for this methodology are really quite exciting. Uh, the traditional idea uh, of someone receiving a prosthetic by going and visiting a specialist in order to get measurements is really no longer necessary. And what this means is that you can serve someone with a device from a great distance, and really the only thing that a person needs to submit measurements is a ruler and a camera phone. Then they can just email the image. And in fact, it's even more exciting than that because you can also email the 3D files. And so in several circumstances, I've been able to receive a photograph of a client, customize a device around that client's anatomy, and then send those 3D files to one of our thousands of volunteers around the world where the device can be printed locally and then given to the end user at no cost to that user. So we've had the opportunity to give away devices at several events. This is our first Enable conference. It was at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in the United States. We were able to assemble over 140 hands. We had families of, uh, of amputees, mostly congenital amputees, uh, coming in and actually assembling devices. The Scouts of America, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, have had several uh, uh, handathon or hand building events, uh, both in small groups and, and in large groups. And uh, they produce uh, large numbers of hands and then ship them off to areas where they're needed. It's a great community service project and it's a great educational project. And this was serious fun. Marvel Universe Live. It's a show with, uh, with uh, Marvel superheroes, they do a stage show. Uh, and we actually were able to get uh, Marvel Universe Live actors to work with the children and their families to assemble devices. I love the idea of superhero hands. So between uh, our assembly events and, and the scouts and universities and schools, elementary schools, middle schools and high schools, and then also our network of volunteers who deliver devices to, uh, to amputees, we've been able to produce and deliver a thousand devices to uh, over a thousand devices to people in over 40 countries around the world. I'm sure you've noticed now, by now, that the hands we make don't really look like hands. They look like something that, you, uh, that a robot might wear or a superhero, and I think that's great. When we ask kids what color they want their hands, they almost never say skin color. They want them in red and blue and green and purple and orange. If you made it look like a hand, it would be like hiding. And they've done enough hiding. What we give them is an opportunity to celebrate their difference. We give them something that's fun, something that's exciting. And when they get it, they walk a little taller. At Enable, we have uh, a couple of very clear goals. We want to reach more people. That's kind of a shocking transition here. Uh, <laughs> modern soldiers wear uh, armor. Uh, many of them wear armor into, into battle. And so uh, what this means is that uh, they're less likely to die. But it also means that we have a lot of soldiers coming home as amputees. So there's a, a very large need there. In developing nations, uh, a lot of uh, developing nations are experiencing uh, an industrial revolution, which means a lot of factory workers working around heavy machinery, heavy equipment. And this often results in accidents uh, that mean that people can't work anymore. There's no way to know how many people are in this situation, but I, I think it's probably a very large number. The problem is that many of them are, uh, are in hiding. They go home and, and they're cared for by their family members. And then, of course, victims of disaster. 
uh, Enable uh, International is uh, proposing uh, that we teach a course in, in Haiti, on IET, uh, in January, uh, that would uh, teach Haitian citizens how to make devices, how to make prosthetics for each other and for themselves. Another clear goal that we have is to expand the number of designs that we have available. We've done very well with our wrist-powered devices. Here's an example of a wrist-powered device. The client needs to have a wrist for this. But they flex their wrist and the fingers open and close. And we've come a long way in our elbow-powered devices. But the potential for this technology is really huge. So Enable encourages designers to design different kinds of devices, and, and more than that, to take those designs and to share them for free, to share them in the open source, so that other people can download them and other people can print them and assemble devices. So you know now what Enable is and what Enable does, but I often hear the question of where is Enable? We don't have a central headquarters. We exist all around the planet. We have uh, regular departmental meetings, several different kinds, uh, uh, via a kind of uh, Skype chat. This is a Google Hangout, and uh, what you're seeing here is a screenshot from last week's uh, Enable uh, town, town Hall meeting. We also have the Google Plus community I told you about, which is a great place uh, if you, uh, you want to help. And if you uh, have any specific questions, uh, there are uh, always a lot of people there who, uh, who, have, uh, who have ideas and, and uh, can help you out with specific problems. And then Enable has a, uh, a YouTube channel uh, that provides uh, education and, uh, and tells some of the things that we're doing. And many of our members also have uh, YouTube channels. I've got one, and it's pretty much devoted to teaching people how, how, to, make, how to make devices. And of course, you can find a lot of, uh, a lot of our designs on Thingiverse. If you're really interested in research and development, we have uh, a lot of different projects going on in a forum. So this is an opportunity for uh, longer term research and development. So if, if you want to develop new designs. And then, of course, there is the Enabling the Future website, where you can see the big picture, you can see the news, and there's also a connection to resources. So I hope you all can join. You're invited. I hope you can get involved. Uh, I, I'd love to see uh, what you can do and on how you can help.